Great. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back. So we've had a sequence of uh, really interesting keynotes, and we're going to continue that with one more. So you've seen me enough today. So my job is to introduce the introducer. We've had that as a pattern today. I'm really happy to introduce yet another person. I don't think I mentioned I played, used to play pickup basketball with Professor Heaster. But the guy that Professor Heaster and I never wanted to be on the team against is our current provost. So I'm going to introduce our current provost, Jay Acreage. He's the provost and executive vice president for academic affairs and diversity. He's got a faculty appointment as a professor of, agricult as a professor of agricultural economics. Before he became our provost, he spent nine and a half, roughly, years as the Glenn Sample Dean of Agriculture. So Jay's been at Purdue for a long time. I don't know, we played basketball since I started here at 12, and Jay was 13, I think, when we just started that. So I'm, I'm happy to introduce Jay Acreage, the provost of Purdue University. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate the, uh, the kind introduction. Yeah, it's been a long time since, uh, since the hardwood, so anyway. But uh, hey, it's a, it's a real pl pl pleasure and a privilege to be with you here this afternoon at, I guess, the second uh, time that you've done this, uh, this Earhart uh, Summit. And my congratulations to all the student leaders that have been involved in, in planning the event. I heard it's been a great day. And uh, certainly, as I looked at the agenda, it looked exciting and, uh, and a lot of interesting perspectives on careers and uh, things happening in this industry. So, uh, so well done. I'm not going to try to recap the uh, history of aeronautics and astronautics at Purdue uh, in a few minutes here. You, many of you in the room know more about that than, than I do. But, you know, there's really no more fitting area for Purdue to lift up than this one. And if you think about our 150th anniversary uh, celebration, giant leaps, uh, obviously, to say it might be connected to, to what's going on in this world is a bit of an understatement. But uh, I know, as all of you know, this event's uh, named for Amelia Earhart. And, and it, this may have been discussed earlier today, but uh, she was really brought to Purdue as a faculty member uh, to support our women students. So, uh, and that was, in my mind, very far-sighted by the president at the time, Edward Elliott. And uh, she actually hosted Purdue's first conference for women in uh, 1935. I think it was titled something like Women's Work and Opportunities. And so, again, a real pioneer in terms of, of bringing women into the work world at a very different time. And I think about 84 years later, she would be awfully excited about a program like this and the speakers that have been in front of you today, and especially excited about the person I get the pleasure to, to introduce to you. So um, it is a, it's a real personal privilege and, uh, to introduce Dr. Kathleen C. Howell, the Shu Lo Distinguished Professor in the School of Aeronautics and, and Astronautics. Uh, some of you know, you're probably in her classes, that she teaches in the area of spacecraft dynamics and control with a focus on orbital and attitude analysis with maneuvers. And that includes sophomore and junior classes in fundamental dynamics, as well as senior and graduate courses in uh, spacecraft attitude and orbit mechanics. And through her research, and some of you would know this and some may not, but Professor Howell has been involved in trajectory design for a number of NASA missions, including the Genesis mission, where solar wind samples were collected and returned to Earth for study, and the Artemis mission, where active spacecraft today are flying near the moon to measure the effects of solar radiation and wind on the lunar surface. You know, these vehicles and missions directly inform Professor Howell's teaching, and, and those of you that are in her classes know that she has the opportunity to bring these real-world experiences into the classroom. And I believe that presents a really amazing opportunity for, for Purdue students. Now, you know, we, many times you see faculty in their classroom and you, you really don't understand uh, maybe the background and the, the stature of the person that's in front of you. But I, I'm going to share a few of these things with you because I think they're very important. In 2017, Professor Howe was inducted as a member of the U.S. Uh, United States National Academy of Engineering, the International Celestial Mechanics Institute, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2018, she was inducted into the International Academy of Astronautics, and these are some of the highest awards and honors bestowed on an engineer. She's been named one of the 20 most important women in science by Discover Magazine, and she's been an inspiration to many, many young women who are interested in STEM, but uh, also young men who are interested in coming into the STEM fields. Some of the Purdue honors she's received include in 1997, she was uh, a founding, inducted as a founding member of Purdue's Teaching Academy. In 2014, she earned the Charles B. Murphy Outstanding Undergrad Teaching Award. That's the highest award this university gives for undergraduate teaching. And in 2019, I had the personal honor of presenting um, Dr. Howell with the Moral Award. 
that's produced most prestigious recognition bestowed on any faculty member for demonstrating excellence across all three of our missions of learning, discovery, and engagement. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Kathleen C. Howell. Thank you, Jay, very much. Very so, wow, who is that person? <laughs> I'm really actually delighted to be here and to talk a little bit. Um, but fundamentally, I'm going to share just one woman's story and a lot of, or a few of the lessons that I learned along the way. So that's actually what I want to focus on today. Um, I realize that some of you were not alive in 1969, but I was. <laughs> and I remember on July 20th, when the first human steps were taken on the moon, I watched it all with my father at our home. And my interest was not really in, from the perspective of wanting to be an astronaut, but it was simply at that time, it was very symbolic of the larger realities that had arrived for advancing space exploration. I wanted to learn the process of getting there, of getting to the moon and getting to everywhere else in the solar system. Some of that would involve robots, some would involve humans, but that's what I wanted to do. And when I was a kid, I didn't really tinker with hardware, but I confess that I was on the high school math team. <laughs> we didn't even have uniforms. Um, I also actually, at Christmas, received a slide rule. <laughs> so I was one of those uh, geeky types. But after asking a lot of questions, I learned that in order to discover how to get to all of these other places, the best college major that I could uh, aspire to was gonna be aerospace engineering. So that's how I decided that was what I was gonna do. However, I was also told by my high school guidance counselor that women don't study aerospace engineering. So I should try another major. And in fact, he thought I should go into education and I could teach kids about space. Now, as excellent a career choice as that might be, I also faced my first real resistance. So my first lesson was to completely ignore the pressure to go into a different field. And that was the first step that I took. Now, I do want to point out, though, that I was very fortunate because the people around me encouraged me and they also told me why not. And so, in fact, my father was a lawyer. He was the general counsel for a large company. And at that time, he was busy moving his company to the forefront of the social issues of the day by hiring uh, some outstanding women attorneys that were the first women lawyers, corporate lawyers in his industry. So he also, with that, gave me some other advice as I was moving off to college. And he said, you can do anything you want, but be the very best you can at what you do. So with that lesson number two, I went off to college. I went to Iowa State University. I was a student in aerospace engineering. My major was dynamics and controls. And that was a fa the place that I first ran into orbital mechanics and what that actually meant. My professor at that time was John Tannehill, who was teaching orbital mechanics. I was hooked, and it wasn't till later that I learned that his specialty was actually CFD. But he was my first link to the topic, and a couple of years ago, I actually got to go back and talk to him, and I really thanked him and appreciated all he did for me at that time. Now, there were also only two women in my undergraduate class in aerospace engineering in the entire department. One of those was me. But I was also living in a time that was not too far removed from that wonderful 1969 date. So this is a little while later. But because I wasn't, I was also very familiar with the Mercury program and the Mercury 7 astronauts. And so that was familiar to me, and of course, the landing of the moon. But it was also the time of the Mercury 13. Now, the Mercury 13 were 13 American women who were part of a privately funded program who underwent 
all the same physiological screening tests as the astronauts that were eventually selected by NASA, which were selected actually in, in 1959 for Project Mercury. Of course, the Mercury 13 were never part of the astronaut corps. They never flew in space, and as a matter of fact, they never even met as a group. And so the question is, why not? This is what you do as a graduate assistant, my assistant. <laughs> so in the 1960s, some women lobbied the White House for inclusion of women in the astronaut program, and they even testified before a congressional committee in 1962. One of the challenges at that time, though, were the requirements to be selected as an astronaut. So many, including President Eisenhower at the time, believed that military test pilots would make the best astronauts. Note, however, that the US Air Force training programs barred women at that time. So if graduation from a military testing school or a military uh, testing program was going to be a requirement to be selected as an astronaut by NASA, it wasn't even possible that any women would be eligible. So the view that test pilots were going to be the most appropriate choice for astronauts greatly influenced the testing requirements for at the astronaut corps and certainly influenced history in terms of those that were chosen for the initial astronaut class. Now, at that time, William Lovelace, who was a former flight surgeon, and later he was chair of a NASA Special Advisory Committee on the Life Sciences, was curious to know how women would do undergoing the same testing. So along with a Brigadier General Flickinger, uh, he invited Geraldine, or Geraldine Jerry Cobb to undergo some of the same rigorous challenges at the men, as the men. Jerry Cobb was truly a trailblazing aviation pioneer, and she was inducted into the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 2012. So Lovelace and Jerry Cobb actually reviewed the records of over 700 women pilots. They inv invited 19 women to come and undergo some of the testing. Now, these women all had at least 1,000 hours worth of flight experience. Jerry herself had 10,000 hours worth. And they were to take the same physical tests as the men. In the end, 13 women passed the same one physical tests, physical examinations that the Lovelace Foundation had, in fact, developed for the NASA astronaut selection process. So Jerry Cobb had actually scored in the top 2% of all the candidates for these programs, men and women included, and including those that were selected for Mercury 7. A few of the women also passed additional testing including Jerry Cobb, who was already an accomplished pilot in the 1960s. She became the first American woman to undergo and pass all three phases of the testing. So it was clear that there was a place that women could hold, yet later on they would gather for what was called the phase three testing. And at the time they'd gathered a, a group of women in order to do that. Jerry had already passed those tests. But the Navy canceled the test within a uh, few days of it actually commencing, where some of the women would have been coming together. The claim was that without an official NASA request to do so, the Navy wouldn't allow use of its facilities. So as a consequence, it wasn't until 1978 that the first women were selected. Now, the first woman in, in space actually was the Rus Russian cosmonaut Valentino Tereshkova, and she was arguably less qualified than some of the women in this testing program because she had no qualifications as a pilot or a scientist. And, and she, rumor says that she had actually thought Jerry Cobb would be the first woman astronaut. Jerry died this year in March 2019 at the age of 88. Now, I recall this story not so much because I wanted to be an astronaut, but because it also reflects the fact that we are all a product of our times as was Jerry Cobb and the other women in the Mercury 13. And it says that there's a lot of different ways to contribute to the advancement of space. Certainly, that group made it possible for the later women to participate, also demonstrated that they could pass all the physical testing. And so I use that as a basis for my lesson three. There are lots of ways to make a difference. Be aware of your own strengths 
and leverage them for your greatest impact. And so that was one of the things that I took with me from my college days. You're doing very good at this job. Yeah. Okay, so upon graduation with my bachelor's degree, the aerospace industry at that time was down. The number of jobs were not very, there weren't very many of them, and they weren't hiring very much. There weren't so many jobs available. Not surprisingly, as, as a couple of the other people noted on the panels, that at the time, I lacked confidence myself. I was almost always the only female in all of my engineering classes. And so I was hesitant. And so I interviewed with many different organizations. I interviewed with some aerospace, but I interviewed a whole bunch of others as two. And so eventually I had to make a choice. And the choice that I actually boiled it down to was line, man, uh, line management in manufacturing or the aerospace industry. Either way, I was going to be a pioneer, whether I liked that or not, which I didn't at the time. And it was also true that this is in the mid-70s, and it was also true that the aerospace industry was not at all inviting to women at that time. However, Procter & Gamble, or P&G, was ready to add gender diversity into their management structure. And actually, they liked interviewing arrows. Remember, P&G, this is like a soap company, right? But they liked interviewing arrows because they felt at that time that arrows had a broader view of the entire system irregardless of what the product was. So that's the choice I made. With my BS engineering degree, I went off and I entered line management at Procter & Gamble Manufacturing in Kansas City. I was the first woman hired at that plant in line management, and I became the floor supervisor in liquids packaging. So I was packaging Joy, Ivory, Dawn, those kind of things that you buy at the supermarket. And actually, there was another woman that was hired, actually, at that time, in um, powder packaging, that was like, you know, uh, powdered Tide. And so, and that woman actually quit almost only a few weeks in. So um, I stuck it out, and I was able to uh, keep going. It, it, it's interesting, though, because at that time, there was one other woman engineer in the entire plant. She was a chemical engineer, and, but she was a process engineer, which meant that there were no employees working for her. So in line management, I was gonna have people working for me. But I really think that her success was the one that encouraged, that made it possible that they could go on to the next step, which was hiring me. Now, I have to be honest here. I absolutely knew nothing about this when I got there. And suddenly, I was supposed to supervise up to 40 people at a time who were unionized workers in a manufacturing plant. So lesson four. Be open to learning new skills because I was thrown into the deep end of the pool for sure. Now, however, I was under a department head, a male department head, which was fine. And I also had a male colleague who was a supervisor of the other shift. So we traded off day shift and evening shift. We learned together and, and actually ourselves and all the people we worked for, we actually eventually came to an equilibrium point. Believe it or not, I was then actually promoted from packaging into production. So that meant that I became the department head of the chemical production of the liquid detergent. So where we mixed it all up and, and out popped Joy, Ivory, Dawn, that, those kinds of detergents. So it was mostly being a chemical engineer. <laughs> so as far as the organization was concerned, the manufacturing plant at that time, I was their first woman, promoted at a relatively long, young age into such a leadership position. It was not always smooth. Um, all the people who worked for me were older than me. That didn't always go well. Um, the technical decisions were where I felt the most comfortable, but I actually had to learn to be the boss. I will tell you we all learned together, but the experience taught me a lot in ways that I had never imagined it helped me prepare for academia. I was working with folks whose life experiences and perspectives were very different from my own. But I discovered that we could always find common ground. So there were many, many lessons that I learned there um, at that position, but I will highlight just two of them. One of them is lesson five. Boy, get comfortable being uncomfortable, because that was like every day. 
And lesson six, whatever the path, take advantages of the opportunities because not everything is gonna be painted as an opportunity for an aerospace engineer. But I learned so much that I rely on today. I didn't even have to train you. Now another choice presented itself to me. And that choice was I could move to Folgers Coffee <laughs> and have yet greater managerial opportunities at a higher level. Or I could give up my path to higher management in manufacturing and return to graduate school. I decided that it was the time for me to return to aerospace. And so I went ahead and made that decision. I lost a lot of money. <laughs> But I went to graduate school at Stanford and uh, went into the Aero Astro program there. So that meant the next part of my life was in graduate school. And I loved graduate school. I worked really hard. I learned a lot. I was told that at the time, I was one of only the first or second women at that time that would eventually graduate in DNC in, in Stanford's program. I'm not sure if that was true, but since I was completely surrounded by men, it sure seemed that way. I was also a teaching assistant, and I really discovered that I liked being in the classroom. And, and actually, as it turned out, I may have learned a little of that in the manufacturing because I had to learn how to take apart and reassemble all the equipment there. And I actually helped other people learn to do that. So maybe it sort of started there. But I really loved it. I even taught a lab class in DNC, and I have to tell you, my current students might not believe this, but I was clearly the best among all the graduate assistants at soldering electrical components. I take pride in that. And actually, it was also a skill I brought with me when I actually taught the controls lab here at Purdue a number of years ago. Anyway. Uh, in graduate school, I was very fortunate that I had three wonderful professors that paved my way. Art Bryson, who was the father of modern optimal control theory, or so he's termed sometimes, who taught me optimization and wrote countless recommendations for me over the years. Now, I might, if I had really understood who he was at the time, I might have been more afraid, but I didn't know. Uh, Dan DeBray, who taught me all the spacecraft dynamics that I know. And then there was John Brakewell, my advisor. Now, at the panel this morning, somebody else mentioned him, but he was my advisor and a mathematician at heart. He had originally worked at North American Aviation Corporation. With the launch of Sputnik in 1957, Lockheed had dragged him away because it was going to be you know, a really big rush at that time. So he eventually arrived at Stanford in 1964. Um, he's considered one of the major developers of the field of astrodynamics, but he was also, because of his other experiences, he was also a practical engineer. So I was able to take advantage of those things. Now, he taught me to question everything and to always ask, which he did, given a problem, what can we do with the stuff we know and what new stuff do we need so we can accomplish the goal? And so at the time, I was kind of, initially, I was kind of just annoyed at those questions, saying, why don't you just tell me? But it was actually a really good approach, and I've used that uh, today. It was also notable that I was his first female graduate student, and I appreciated the fact that to him that was a non-issue. Now, I mention him specifically because not only did I like what he was doing, but he sent me to JPL. And I went to JPL to learn about a problem that now forms the basis of much of my personal research and the basis of the research that a lot of my students do. So I went there and I turned out to be um, planning, I was helping to plan the mission to TP Temple, also known as Temple Two. Now that's a short period family comet. So interestingly, for that particular mission, which didn't actually fly, but we were planning it at that, at, that, at that time. And one of the questions, when you think about planning the mission to this comet, one of the questions was, can we like orbit a comet? This really little thing? Can we actually get into orbit about it? Now today we know that the answer is yes, but we didn't know that at the time. And so in my first ever paper, technical paper, I worked with Jerry Jones, who was the 
supervisor for the Interplanets Analysis Group at JPL, and Chen Wan Yen, who some of the folks here might even know. And we produced zero velocity curves for the Sun Comet system. Now I know there's only a few people who know what that is, but that was a big deal at the, at the time. We also sought fundamental behaviors in such a re regime so we could actually answer yes and determine exactly how you would accomplish that. I really enjoyed that experience and went on to uh, work on halo orbits in my PhD. However, once again, I was challenged by outsiders who looked at my research in orbital mechanics and said or asked, why was I working in this particular area? No one will ever care about this. It's purely an academic exercise and I will never be able to sustain a career in orbital mechanics. Uh, lesson seven, find something that you're really passionate about and become really good at it. And so I persevered. I'm also very lucky again because John Breakwell, some of the other notables in this field are Roger Brooke and Victor Zebehe, and they all believed it was not a waste of time, and they all encouraged me to keep going. And so when I gave my first talks, when I went to a conference, there was nobody in the room but me and Roger Brooke. So the conclusion was nobody cares. But in this subject area, if you go to a conference today, the room is typically packed. So I guess they were right. And I continued to pursue that area. Now, I can do mission planning for a lot of different missions. But I preferred interplanetary. And I was pretty good at it. I was also really the best at what they call, or interested at that time, what they called the exotics the exotic trajectories, and I wanted to keep working in that range. Those were the trajectories that everybody was surprised at. They were, didn't know what they looked like, and they weren't very predictable. So those were sort of important points for me in my graduate career. Now, graduate school was also a time for me to introduce myself to other professionals in the community. So participating in conferences, working with my advisor, and so on, and looking back, I would say that my advisor and the other professors in that department were instrumental in, in pointing the way for how I should engage the research community in my discipline. It was also a time to really learn how to network. And from the perspective, not necessarily of just meeting other professionals, but also developing relationships where I could showcase my professional competence in this particular research community. Now remember, there were a lot of naysayers, so I also had to learn, I also had to build a case for why my research was important. It's very cool, but I also had to justify why it was important. And going into academia at a later time, I also had to convince folks that it would be worth the monetary investment at some point in the future. I also had to develop my own long view my longer vision of the field, and what impact I might be able to make in a particular technical area. So if you're a graduate student here, it is never too, long, too early to think about that, to think about where you want to go and what technical contributions you think you can make. I did have more choices when it was time to graduate, though. I, again, again, I interviewed at lots of different places. I, I did an interview again at P&G, though. I have to convince, I have to tell you that. But I did go to industry. I went to government. I went to universities and so on. I think I interviewed everywhere because, again, I was hesitant. I wasn't so confident. And I wasn't, uh, I was afraid to really take steps in the direction I wanted to go. In the end, it came down to two choices. <clears throat> and what I did is I turned down JPL in order to come to Purdue. And so, again, I had to ignore some pressures, but... I did it. So now I'm a faculty member at Purdue in astrodynamics and space applications. Now the first thing I'd like to do is sort of talk about what is that field, what does it encompass? It does a lot of things, uh, the motion of natural and man-made objects, but it incorporates all aspects of space flight, all types of orbits and trajectories, which is a lot of what I do, but it also means trajectory and attitude optimization, orbit determination, 
remote sensing, looking at the space environment, navigation, guidance, attitude control, telemetry and communications. These days, we've also got constellations and formation flight, mission operations, all of those things kind of come under that category. So you might now look at me and say, so how is it going? Okay, I think. Thinking back, I did arrive at Purdue excited, eager, and actually I was also fortunate because at that time, Purdue offered me the opportunity to do a test drive. I could come for a semester and just see how I liked it. During that semester, I actually kept interviewing at other places, <laughs> but they said it was okay, so I did. Um, but in the end, I actually decided to stay. So there were a multitude of reasons, but, but three of the ones that I would point out for why I decided to stay in academia and, and actually stay at Purdue. At that time, I would be absolutely the only faculty member in orbital mechanics and spacecraft mission design. Now, at the time, that was scary. Remember, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So I decided to go ahead. Um, and actually, when I got here, orbital mechanics was taught by a faculty member who was actually known for optimization. I guess we got a little closer than my own professor in CFD, but it still wasn't right on. Um, but Purdue actually emphasized to me that I could be instrumental in building the area. Turns out that, that the area is broader now. It took a lot longer time than I was promised, but we made it, pretty much. Now, the other thing, number two, one of the other reasons that was very influential for me was that on my recruiting trip, which some of you may take sometime if you are um, interested in academic position, the department head of Aero at the time set up a meeting with the, with the only two other women who were in engineering at Purdue. There were only two others at that time. They were in electrical engineering, and he set up that meeting. Now, one of those women faculty members that I met with on that day turned out to be a long-time mentor during my career here. She's been invaluable in my professional development and was my advocate when needed. My head at that time, Henry Yang, who's, who's not here at Purdue anymore, but he was also a key advocate as I started my career here at Purdue. So that's another lesson, lesson eight. Know your mentors as well as your advocates. They may not be the same, but appreciate the different roles they may play in your career. Now the third one is something that I don't even think Purdue knew at the time. But Purdue was also the home to Harry Pollard. He was a mathematician. He was in the de uh, Department of Mathematics here. And he was known for his work on celestial mechanics and the in-body problem, which is what I was interested in. Unfortunately, the year I arrived is the year that Harry Pollard passed away. And so I never even got to me meet him. But I was pretty excited at the time. Now. What do I do every day? That's what some of the students in the mentoring session asked me this morning. What do you like do? So a little, uh, a little note, which I think was alluded to a few minutes ago, maybe by Bill, which was that success in academia uh, relies upon pretty much three pillars, discovery or research, publishing and funding, learning and teaching, and engagement and service. So. When I think about those three things, it's kind of interesting at different points in time how I've uh, been able to engage in those different types of activities. The first one, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give a first example from when I just arrived because it's relevant to a question that was asked at the earlier panel. So when I arrived, uh, it's been a few decades ago, but at that time I was the only woman on the Aero faculty because there were only two others and they were in double E. So I was only the only woman on the Aero faculty. And therefore, clearly, I was the go-to faculty member for any assignments that related to diversity efforts in the school, in the college, in the university, wherever they were, I was the one. Now that has changed over time, I realize that. But at the time, I also really had to internalize the fact that, lesson nine, you are more than a stereotype, 
you are more than your gender. And so that was an important lesson that I learned just by being in that situation. But I also say that reflecting back on one of the other lessons I had, which was just take that and make it an opportunity. So that became my opportunity that I had that my other assistant professor colleagues at that time did not receive. I got to know more faculty across the College of Engineering as well as across the entire university. I also gained access to some higher level administrators. For example, the dean and the provost at that time. So it gave me, used to putting a, a good picture on it, it gave me visibilities at higher levels that actually offered me some long-term benefits. So it also allowed me to understand a university from a broader setting, which helped me in my own job. And I came to realize that although I haven't necessarily been interested in taking advantage of them, there are as many other opportunities in a university setting as there may be in another type of organization. So if you are interested in being an academic, there's other types of avenues you could pursue, such as department head. Come on, be enthused. <laughs> no, no. So remember, no matter what happens, take advantage of the opportunities. Not all of them, you may not see all of them have opportunities at the time. For me too, I would also say that one of the advantages or one of the things that attracted me to academia, that's not true for all, but for me it was, was teaching in the classroom. I enjoy interacting with students a lot. I like to share my enthusiasm about my topic. I know some of the students feel that, you know, I'm not aware that they take other things, but really I am. In my first semester, I was actually really nervous about the fact that all the decisions in a classroom would be mine, but I think probably new employees everywhere had misgivings. Um, I did enjoy the opportunity to try new ways of delivery. And so the educational landscape is changing a lot right now. Uh, you guys, everyone in this room is probably more savvy than I am at the emerging, emerging technology options. Um, but I think with or without those, uh, those technology gains. In an academic position, you have a great opportunity to impact the next generation of engineers, not only in your specialty, but certainly even the broader core of engineering talent. And, and that impact can really uh, affect people for decades. So if that opportunity is one that's appealing, a, a faculty role is a direct path to influence that. And that's a, uh, huge responsibility, but it's also kind of an exciting way in order to influence the future. At the same time, I do take to heart that I should capitalize on the pioneering age of technology, and I'm trying. So there's a lot of different things that we can do. We're trying as a department, and I think education in general is changing more rapidly. than Some of you I talked to earlier were freshmen more rapidly than you would even realize. So the final area is the research area, and um, that's an opportunity. Um, mentioned this morning at the panel that was earlier, you get to focus on problems that are of interest to you, so that's an appealing piece of it. Eh, well, not always, but mostly. Um, that's not really separated from your other tasks as an academic, um, and students, but students are almost always involved in some way. And so that's also, I, for me, that's also a positive. In an academic role in comparison to some industry and government um, positions, I also have the opportunity to view the future and consider the long term. Long term developments that might be critical to the developments we're interested in. Now, what those might be for me has changed a lot over the years. But I do have a long-term view and a long-term plan for my own program here at Purdue. I hope to make significant progress. I've been aided immeasurably by the tremendous talented graduate students that I've had over the past and currently. But I also understand that if I've really articulated some of the things we need to do, my plan will never be finished. And I'm okay with that. So if we can make progress 
as things become more complicated, there's a wider range of mission scenario. Uh, thinking about the next generation of capabilities, the next generation of algorithms, just the next generation of ideas, it's a great place in order to sit down and be able to tackle those. Now, like many faculty, I view my research goals sort of of three types, and I'll give some examples there. The first type is things to do now. So problems that I address with, with my students, problems that we address because we've been asked to do so immediately for some particular issue. Now, an example of that is uh, the mission MAVEN. MAVEN went to Mars. It is not a human mission. It is they're looking for information, learning about the atmosphere of Mars. Now, MAVEN launched November 2013, and it reached Mars on September 22nd, 2014. Launched November 2013. Now, there was a new comet discovered in January 2013. It was called Siding Spring, and it was predicted in October of 2014, just a month after MAVEN got to Mars, to pass by Mars and potentially had the potential possibility of interfering with the spacecraft that was there. So we got a request to say, this comet was just discovered, it's gonna come by Mars, MAVEN's gonna be at Mars, do you have any way that we could like move out of the way and not use any propellant? And there was only a few months to try and do this. So that was something that had to be done like now. And of course, as soon as you thought about it and as soon as you worked on it and everything, they got some better uh, parameters for the trajectory that Siding Spring would take and it turned out it didn't go near Mars. So we didn't have to implement or anything. But that's an example of something that you might be asked to do like right away. So you do a bunch of those kinds of things. The next type of category would be ideas and proposals for like a decade or so out. So these are where we can respond to roadmaps or projects that enable capabilities that improve understanding. Some things that we might be able to do, uh, they're still, you know, decade to 15 years, but you have to start that far ahead in order to do them. I know in uh, the provost in the introduction, he mentioned Genesis, and Genesis was one of those types of missions. Genesis was actually a concept. Now, what it did was it was going to go leave the Earth and go out to a Sun-Earth L1 Lagrange point, which meant that it was going to go out to a spot on the line between the Sun and the Earth, and it was going to hang out there. Particles stream off the Sun, and Genesis was just going to open itself and collect some of those particles and then bring them back to Earth. So that particular mission had been proposed before under other names, which we were also uh, participated in. But when, it, when, the, when the name was Genesis, that one actually got approved, and we went into a mission uh, design scenario, and Genesis launched on August 8, 2001. Now, the reason that we worked on it, though, was because over, the, over a long time, a long, much longer time, with some of our, uh, with one of my JPL colleagues, we worked on a new strategy to do some of these more complicated types of scenarios. A new approach that you might use that would leverage some new information about what we understand about how things move through the solar system. And Genesis was gonna be the first actual mission that was gonna leverage those new ideas. And it did, it was very successful. Um, it landed, it returned back on Earth in 2004. If anybody remembers that landing, it actually came through the clouds. I, I had it on TV, the TV on in my class. It was very timely. It came screeching back in and no parachutes. And so it landed splat in Utah. Um, however, 80% of the data was recovered, and so it was very uh, successful from that point of view. I would like you all to know that the orbital mechanics part was perfect. It was, um, when they put the spacecraft together and built it, there was a component that was about the size of the, end, the eraser on the end of a pencil, and it was that component was put in upside down. So the chutes didn't open. 
but it was still very successful. We got all the data back and we basically had a test that said some of these new strategies would work very well for planning and operations. And so that was a very uh, gratifying, uh, successful mission. Now, the third area that I work on in research is really long-term questions. Now, sometimes long-term things, you work on them for a long term, and then they actually go into a mission scenario, and so that's, that works pretty well. Um, and there's different parts of that that we do in my particular area. So right now, we're actually working on what I might call orbital infrastructure, which is as we move out away from being in low Earth orbit, there's a lot of other types of motion that we can leverage in the, in the environment. And so we've been working hard for a long time in order to learn more about that. And I would say in this category, I would put gateway. We work a lot on gateway. Does everybody know what gateway is? Okay, so in the human program, gateway is the module that the humans, at, originating at JSC, the humans are going to go out to the gateway and from there, they can go to lots of other destinations. And right now, the focus is to go from gateway down to the surface of the moon. But the idea with gateway is that it is going to be a, a facility that is away from the earth that is closer to the moon. And so in a, in a broader sense, it's gonna be a place where, for example, you could go to lots of other destinations. You can go to the surface of the moon, you can go to Mars, you can go to other places. So that, that's the long-term goal for that great gateway facility. The interesting thing about gateway and what we're working on um, associated with it is because right now it's supposed to be in an orbit that is called a near rectilinear halo orbit or an NRHO. And I put this in the long-term category, even though we're working on it like now, because um, that orbit actually appeared in one of the first technical papers I wrote with my advisor back in the 1980s. So, you know, all those folks who were telling me, get out of this, none of this is ever gonna be useful, who cares? Here we are. So finally, it did take a long time though, I do have to admit, but finally it's getting, it's getting used and leveraged. So we do some other kinds of stuff too in, in working on things. Um, we don't have to stay in just one area. So one of the other projects that was a sort of a long-term goal, but we worked on it uh, with some of the faculty in Earth and Planetary Sci Sciences in particular, Jay Maloche, we worked on that one together and we took scientific data from GRAIL, the GRAIL mission, and evaluated the two spacecraft that were moving around the moon and evaluated the gravity field on the moon based on the trajectories of those two vehicles and determined that there was a significant possibility that there might be uh, caves or, or open lava tubes under the surface of the moon. We the, that followed up with a Japanese mission, which was not actually to target or look for those things. They were doing something else. But they found that they would pass over the region where we had predicted one of these things. And they had some actual operational evidence that this might, in fact, be the case. And so that has produced more uh, interest in determining if these things really exist on the moon. And if they do on the moon, we've worked with other colleagues to assess their stability and so on. That means that they might also be on Mars, which would also be a useful thing for the human uh, flight program. So those are some of the things that we started out thinking they were longer term things, but actually have proved fruitful. I have one other example that we also looked at because that actually was also mentioned in the panel this morning. Where's my assistant? And that was, we also worked on something for planetary protection. So we worked on a, a program where the Russians actually, the, the Russian space program, they were gonna send a, a uh, mission to collect some samples off of Phobos, which is a moon of Mars. And so they were gonna collect some samples there and bring them back to Earth for analysis. Now planetary protection was, oh my gosh, if we bring back some particles from another planet and put them on Mars, what are the chances that we might have something alive? Or what are the chances that we might have some contamination? And so we looked at it not necessarily from the perspective of the design of the orbits, but we looked at it from the perspective of 
if something, if an asteroid hit Mars many, many eons ago and shot up material off the surface of Mars and it landed on Phobos, what percentage of that material might we bring back that was due to uh, some kind of comet which might have uh, which might have some life on it that would actually eventually work its way back to Earth. So that was very exciting. We found out that there would actually be perhaps enough of a sample that could actually test for that kind of particle. Um, unfortunately, uh, this was called Phobos Grunt was the name of the mission. And just as they were, just as the Russian vehicle was trying to exit Earth orbit, it actually blew up. So we didn't actually get to test that. But that's a kind of problem that we might work for planetary protection. So that was another interesting one. So in any case, those are some of the examples of the kinds of things that I do as a faculty member and thinking about what problems might be out there. Clearly, when I do this kind of research, it is not a lonely quest. I actually work with a lot of other people, um, interact with my professional colleagues, my students, a lot of people I work with beyond the university. Um, some of my very first collaborators, collaborators were from my own academic family. Um, some of my first grants were from my academic family, other advisees from my advisor who were older than I and had moved their way through this system. And so I, I think that that has been very helpful to me. And I see such successful networks going on in my own students. And I think that those, are, are in, those relationships are invaluable. So of course, the lesson that you've heard all day today, which is network, network, network. So I'm also involved in a lot of other uh, service activities. I don't really regret any of it. I've learned a lot. And so I also do a lot of um, engagement and service uh, through the university, but also through professional societies. So I've actually networked and made a lot of technical contacts through those professional societies and those other um, types of, of, of partners. Now, as I look back over my own career, one thing you've learned is that it was long. But anyway, as I look back, I also observe another pattern, which is important. At every single stage of my career, every single one, there were folks that were critical for my professional development and success. If anybody ever, and I've mentioned some of those names along the way, and I did that on purpose, because it's important to me to recognize the people who have helped me along. And so as I, as I think about that, I think it's an important lesson to remember. So that's my lesson 12. No one makes it alone. And if anybody tells you that they made it all by themselves, I would say that's not true. So that the folks that may step into your life may do it a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's a mentor. Sometimes it might be just a conversation. But more often than not, it's an opportunity that has made a huge difference along the way. So as you go on and are su successful in your own career, I think it's always too important to remember that lesson. And whenever you can, use your position, your career, and take the opportunity to offer opportunities to others. You know, sort of pass it along. And that's an important part of what, what I think makes what made me successful. So I want to pass it on to others. Now, the final lesson doesn't even have a number anymore. I just call that one just put up the good fight. And I just want to leave you with a quote that I actually have on my desk. So I've had this on my desk for a long time. This is a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Hard to believe, I know. Finish each day and be done with it. You have done what you could. Some absurdities and blunders have crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. You shall begin it serenely and with too high a spirit to be encumbered by your old nonsense. Thank you, guys. Thank you to Professor Howell. I think we have a couple minutes for questions, I think. One or two questions. Uh, so obviously going back to the, the beginning of your um, talk, you worked in industry before you returned to graduate school. I did. Um, how did you find that transition and, and do you think that that's something you'd recommend or that was just related to your circumstances? It wasn't a conscious decision I made that I'm going to be an academic and I think this is the road I should take. 
that's just the way it fell. But I learned an awful lot from that experience. And I think others might have told me that, oh, you're ne once you get there, you're never going anywhere else. But I learned a lot of things that I didn't expect or plan to learn. And I think that was important to my future success. Would I recommend it to anybody else? It depends on the individual circumstance, I think. Um, but it was very different from what I do now. And I think the lesson for me is it doesn't, I mean, whatever experience you have, you can learn a lot of things that you can apply. And so from that point of view, um, I think it was really positive. Anybody else? Oh, no, this is going to be like a class, right? Pulling it out of them. <laughs> yes. How do I manage my time between all these things? Not always well. <laughs> that is hard. It really is. And, and one of my failings, I think, is that I like to be involved in a lot of things. So probably the lesson I didn't have in there and the lesson I haven't learned is to say no. Sometimes you just can't do it all. Okay. But I like, I enjoy a lot of these different kinds of things. And, and actually myself, when I interact with industry, I usually, I'm doing it just because I'm interested in what they're all talking about, and that's usually how I make my first contacts. I'm not good at going in in colds and saying, I need some money. So building those relationships, I think, is the key. But I'm still learning to try and manage my time. Anybody else? Yes. OK, this is a nerdy question. You, you mentioned something, and I've heard of it before, but can you explain in like a 30-second soundbite, what's a Lagrange point, and why are they important? Oh, no, this is like, you know, memories. <laughs> 45 seconds, go. <laughs> OK, OK. So these are points, for example, between the Earth and the Moon, where the gravitational influence plus the rotation, because the, moon, the Earth is moving around the Sun, or this is between the Earth and the Sun, pardon me. So the gravitational effect of the Earth and the Sun, as well as the fact that they're rotating all balance. So we could stay there at an empty point in space in theory. Okay, And so now what we've learned, which we didn't know, was that we could actually fly in orbits around those points. And they have lots of applications. So it's like orbiting an empty point in space. Yes, it's true. You're, you're looking quizzical. But you can do that and actually offer some more op Opportunities. So early on, those were, you know, a couple, some of the exotics. That that particular one I was referring to is a halo orbit, but there's lots of other kinds. And so there's a lot more ways. There's a lot more pathways through the solar system than we had previously imagined, and that's what we try to use. And actually, one of the long, really long-term projects I'm working on with a JPL colleague is we'd like to map all the roadways through the solar system. They would include some things like that. Is that help at all, kind of. OK. Anybody else? I think we have time for one more. I'm not seeing a lot of people who are dying to be academics. <laughs> oh, there's, there's one. OK, OK, good. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenges in orbital mechanics today, and where do you see the field going in the future? Well, one of the biggest challenges, I think, is that we think we know it all, and we absolutely do not. The problems that the, the solutions are unknown. Um, we only know as much as we do because of the computational capabilities we've gotten in the last few years. Um, but I think that there's a lot of things we don't know, which means that there's a lot of other opportunities that we haven't yet taken advantage of. And so that's right now, that's what a lot of folks are working on. How do we leverage some of those things? Now, at the same time, we're also talking about, you know, it's expensive to put rockets up and get to places and so on. How can we cut that down? How can we make that more efficient? Okay. That was the last question you said, so I think we're done. Thank you so much, Professor Hall. Okay.